It's in my DNA. From above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. Oh, yeah. Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby. The size of it. G'day and welcome to Al McGlashan's podcast, the best job in the world. Bloody oath it is, I tell you, absolutely love it. And you know what? I have to make an apology. Straight off the bat, I'm going to make an apology and say, I'm sorry that I have not done a podcast. God, it must be over a month. Might even be longer, I'll be honest. Because I cannot believe the response. And I'll say thank you to each and every one of you that have come in asking for it. Because you know what? In this day and age, we don't get... Well, you know what? In this day and age, we do get a lot more response. In the old days when it was just papers and the old days of writing magazine articles and all that, you got a bit of response. Now, thanks to social media, everyone can respond. And I have to say, for the amount of people that have come back and said they've listened to us about me, you know, yabbing on and... I fall asleep talking sometimes. I am absolutely honoured by all the comments and stuff. Everyone coming back to us saying how much they love it. If there's one thing I can get out of this podcast that I can do for everyone is to inspire more people to get outdoors and enjoy it and appreciate nature for what it really is. Fishing, hunting, full driving, camping, hiking, the whole lot. And it's, and spear fishing, throw that in as well. And it's getting everyone out there doing it because this is what it's all about. For me, it's enjoying it. Don't lock it up. But speaking of locking up, what are we going to talk about this week? Well, you know what? I've had a lot of shout outs and a lot of people sending in you know, requests and all that sort of stuff. Actually, that's not shout outs, is it? Oh, God, I'm not up to scratch with this sometimes, am I? Shout outs when you want someone to mention their name. So this isn't a shout out because... This is about all the people that have been sending in you know, requests on what we talk about, because that's one thing I want. I want the feedback from everyone. I want you to come back and tell me what you want to hear. So a lot of people have talked swordfish, and I'll probably go and get someone, an expert. I'll probably have to get Richie for that one. Get him on board, do a podcast with him, and bluefin. I'm amazed how many people have talked bluefin, and it couldn't be better time, because you know what? We're doing a big documentary on the moment. It's taking me, it's two years in the making, this puppy. It is huge. And it's been an absolutely amazing journey because it's something that's close to my heart too. But it's about to be released in the next month or so. And it's going on and it's huge. Probably the best documentary I've ever been involved with. All right, it is actually the only documentary I've been, that I've produced. But it's my first time producing a documentary. So I like to say it's next level. This is not fishing show stuff, just, you know, this is a proper, hard-hitting, fact-finding mission. And you know what? It's been an absolutely awesome journey for me. Because as a kid, Bluefin have played such a major role in my own career over the years. And, you know, to be able to give something back and show everyone all the facts and everything around what happened with Bluefin, how they disappeared, why they're coming back, and what we can do, because we're all involved with going forward. And... If you put it one way, if there's one thing I've learned out of this whole amazing journey is that everyone's played a role, from the fishermen to the recreationals to the scientists to the uh, fisheries managers, even some of the greenies. Now, I'm not normally very nice to the greenies because they're not much help to what we do, but you know what? There have been a lot of groups that have understood God help us that they actually realise that we need to work together to look after these fish. And you know what? The southern bluefin tuna is a classic example of where fishing actually saved the tuna. That's actually a little cut straight out of the out of the doco, but it sounds so good and it's so important to what we do. We need to change the way we think about the oceans. We need to get it out of our head that we're going to lock it up. 
because you can't lock it up. We're overpopulating the world. There's no two ways about it. All these people carry on about, oh, we're going to put marine parks in. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. No, we need to manage the oceans and look after them. And you don't look after them by locking people out of it. God, it didn't take me long to start hitting the greenies, did it? But you know what? A lot of them understand and are looking forward. And it's about working with fishermen. Now, over the years, I've changed the way, like I used to be against long lining and all these commercial things. And do you know what? I went out and did it. I went out with my mate Shane and went out and did it and said, you teach me. We weren't friends at that stage, trust me. I said, you need to teach me and show me what you do. Because how can I have an opinion if I don't do it? And believe me, social media is full of opinions from people that have no bloody idea. So I went and did it and it changed the way I thought about it. So And that became an integral part of Bluefin. So what is it about Bluefin that we love so much? Well, first and foremost, there are actually three species. When they talk about endangered species and all that sort of stuff, there are actually three different species of bluefin. You've got the southern bluefin tuna, which is the one we catch here. Now, southern ocean, they spawn up in off Java there between Australia and Java, only known spawning grounds. They go down, they feed all the way across the bottom of the Indian Ocean, all the way into the Atlantic now. They come around into the Bight, they come around to the Tasman Sea, and even into the Pacific, around the other side of New Zealand there. They're one of the biggest migrations on Earth, and no one knows anything about it because it's in the middle of the ocean. Then we have the Pacifics. Now, the Pacific bluefin grow a lot bigger. So southern bluefin grow around 200 and, 200 and something kilos, a bit over that. Your Pacific grow to over 300, I think it's about three, 400 kilos, somewhere in that range. I could be, could be stand, could stand corrected on that. They spawn up off Japan and they go across to, you've probably seen in my, um, everyone from America, California and all that have been catching them there. They're the ones actually that get the massive dollars in Japan. So that the, you know, a million, two million dollar fish, whatever it is, because they catch them locally. It's like in Australia when we have the first crate of mangoes that goes out, goes to auction. It's the most you know, expensive. Same with the bluefin. First one caught locally is the big dollar one, but it's caught locally in Japan. Then you've got the Atlantics. Now, these are the big boys. These are the ones that Prince Edward Island and my mates are complete angler, Rush and bloody, you know, Mark and Big Phil, all that. And Chris and all that went over there and fished for them. And they're the really big ones. I think the record's something like 1,600 pounds. So they're massive. What's really interesting is they drop right down, they're coming back. And it was only through tagging that we were actually allowed to start even fishing for them. And a bit of what I'm going to talk about today will be controversial because in places like, you know, uh, over in uh, Prince Edward Island there in Canada, you can't actually go fishing for them unless you're on a commercial boat. So we got it pretty good here. So some people aren't going to like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to get give you a few facts along the way. Besides, it's always good to stir them up. Now, they're the big boys. They're only in the Atlantic. They go into the Mediterranean. They stay up mainly, as far as I understand, in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't think they come down any further. I think they come into the Gulf of Mexico, and I think they might actually spawn down there. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that side. Your Pacifics are probably the one that's... They've been good off uh, Californian coast there recently in northern Mexico. There's been bigger, and I've seen some stuff on Instagram from the guys over there. My God, they get some good bait ball and action there, like just throffing on the surface. But we're talking about southern bluefin tuna. This is the one that is the amazing fish that has had an unbelievable journey. In fact, what I'm going to do later on, I'm actually going to – now, this is me and technology. I'm going to go live on Instagram – and we're going to get some questions in as well. So this is the next level in podcasting, our style. And you'll be glad to know that I actually turned my phone off, my computer's off, so I won't get any messages through it. Although I did hear a vibration just there before. Didn't turn that off. So back to bluefin. So the southern bluefin tuna. Now, let's go to my history to start with, because this is all, this crux of this started when I took the guys from Complete Angler, who, well, not the guys, the guys that won the Complete Angler fishing with a mate competition to go fishing with. And this is what inspired this whole thing to kick off as a podcast. As a kid, I never saw a bluefin. Never saw a bluefin. Can you believe it? 
So the younger blokes now probably can't imagine it. I used to go to Portland, which is in the west coast of Victoria there, and we used to fish with the Victorian Game Fishing Club, and we used to chase, I think it was the, I don't know, Portland Bluefin Classic or Portland Tuna Classic or something like that. And guess what? We never caught a fish, never caught a bluefin. In fact, I don't even remember any ever being weighed to the point where they shut the competition down, finished, gone. And it was only in 2006, I think it was, might have been 2007, when I was fishing over in Exmouth and I heard about these massive tuna. I thought it was a joke. My mate Tim rang me going, mate, one of the boys just caught a 80 kilo bluefin. Now, this is how dedicated I am. I got on a plane from Exmouth. So Exmouth is over in West Australia, uh, famous for its marlin fishing these days. Eddie caught that 1,000 pound, the first 1,000 pound blue marlin in Australia over there. And got on a plane. Instead of going back to Sydney, I went straight to Melbourne. My brother picked me up with the boat on the back. And I know I've talked about this briefly in previous podcasts, but it's just such a great story. Pick me up with a boat at the airport. You would not be able to do that these days. Can you imagine pulling up at the airport with a boat on the back? Oh my God, you'd be in trouble. And we drove straight down and we caught them. We caught those bloody tuna. And it was, we got some 70s and a 90, I think it was. And Trevor Hogan, the Melbourne fishing celebrity. It was just one of those just amazing times where it all came together and it was a fish that dreams were made of. But for me, all it did was fire me up even more because catching a 70 kilo one, all my life, all I ever dreamed about was a 100 kilo tuna. Only way I was ever going to catch a 100 kilo tuna was going to be a yellowfin off Bermagui. At the very same time, the yellowfin at Bermagui because he used to fish at the northern end of Montague Island there. So Bermagui, south coast, New South Wales, the big yellowfin used to come in there and feed, and then they just, we just fished them out. Everyone blames the pros, everyone blames everyone else. Do you know what? Everyone caught them and everyone kept them. And my theory, and this is just sort of going on a slight tangent, is that the school, a certain school knew to come back and feed, they used to call it Tuna Alley on the Montague Island. Once you fish that school down to a certain level, they don't come back. It's like a tribe mentality. And I'd be very interested to hear whether you agree or disagree on this. So once you fish them down, the remaining guys, you know, the remaining, the leftovers in the school go, I'm not going back there. And then they vanished. And now the only yellowfin you catch are way out past the shelf in New South Wales. So they don't come to the inshore grounds because it wasn't just Montague. They used to do it on the peak off Sydney. And they used to do it, I think it was up in the... um a coast where those big yellowfin used to come, and then they just vanished. So that was the last of the big 100 kilo tuna. So suddenly, these bluefin have reappeared. We've caught them, and then there's reports of 100 kilo fish. They were still rare in those days, and the best spot was Eagle Hawk Neck in Tasmania, down in the southeastern corner of Tassie, down on the Tasman Peninsula there, and I decided when I was doing Strike Zone DVDs, which was where my whole career, and I suppose this is why bluefin is so important to me, where it was all forged from, was to drive or tow a boat all the way down from Sydney, ran it across on the ferry, which is so expensive for guys that have boats. It's ridiculous. You got a caravan, you go cheap. You got a boat, they screw you to the wall. I don't know if they don't like fishermen. I'm not sure what it is, but whatever it is, it cost us a a small mint. Lucky I had a gold card for that went across and drove down and caught a 100 kilo bluefin. 103, I think it went. Took me a week, a week of fishing. But it was one of those weeks that was an amazing adventure. Now, Eagle Hawk Neck is spectacular. You don't fish offshore. You don't have to go miles and miles out to sea. Instead, you fish against the, the cliffs, right against the shoreline. In fact, one of the best spots is called the Hiplots, which is a basically a big chunk of granite that sits, oh, I think it's, 5Ks offshore or something like that. It's not that very far out. And you catch them trolling like literally up against the rocks. And then you've got the Pillars, you've got Tasman Island, all these spots that are really good. You're fishing really, really shallow. So for me, being an offshore fisherman, you fish offshore to catch big fish. You don't fish on the shore. And trust me, you fish on the shore down there. And I struck up a friendship with Stewie and Lockie and the boys who run charters down there. Well, in those days, it was only Stewie. Lockie and the boys were all, they're only little fellas at that stage. 
And it hit off a, a friendship with the guys down there that were passionate. They helped us. You know, we turn up from the mainland. And I remember one bloke telling me that we couldn't catch fish on laser pros down there. You had to use red and white feather jigs. I said, why not? And he said, oh, you don't catch them down here. And I went, really? Well, we caught that big 103 kilo fish on it. And I tell you what, we've caught, in fact, all my big bluefin have been on the same lure since. A 190 laser pro. There you go. And it is in the blue mackerel color. There. The only thing I do is I change the trebles to single hooks. Just a big single on the belly these days. But recently I got asked by the guys at Club Marine who do all insurance. They said, righty we're doing a competition where you win a day with Al. Or you win a fishing trip, I should say. Not a day, a couple of days fishing with Al. And it's we're going to get one bloke's going to win it. He's going to bring his mate. Fishing with mates, that makes a lot of sense. Where would you go? It's got to be somewhere special to you. And I went, hmm. I picked Ascension Island. They said no because it was too expensive. Ah, any kidding. I said, rightio, you know where we're going? We're going to go to Tassie and fish Eagle Hawk Neck because that first 100 kilo bluefin was something that was really special that I thought I'd never get. So we're going there. So in the end, they had a massive, apparently it was huge. I didn't know how many people wanted to fish with us, the poor buggers. There must be, oh. I can't believe they wanted to do it. In the end, Pete Cunningham won from South Australia and he got his mate Nige, who actually fishes up at Port Stephen, so just on the north coast, just north of Sydney. So they drove down, met us. I took the camera crew down. I had Nick there, met up with them, met down at the Lufra Hotel there. And the beauty is you can sit there having a beer and right out the front is the Hippolyte Rocks. That's how close it is. you know. And it's a really spectacular spot because you've got these cliffs. I think it is the highest sea cliffs in Australia. I'm pretty sure it is, that 100, uh, 300 foot, so 100 meet, over 100 metres straight down. So you fish up against the rocks. And the great thing is the prevailing wind is offshore. So when you've got 100 metre cliffs, you're fishing in under the cliffs. You can fish in literally any weather. And you know what? I fished in some horrendous weather. I fished in 50 knots down there one day because apparently, and this is a good little story, Stu Nichols told me, the worse the weather, the better the fish. They love it. They're fishing. They love it. They go off. I went, righty up. I'm into it. Tomorrow's 50 knots. Sour west. We'll tuck in under the cliffs. We'll fish. Well, I fished in it. I was the only one out there. It was calm, but like the wind would come down the gullies, scream down the gullies, and then oh, I was doing 360s in the boat. I chopped my lures off. It was a nightmare, and I never got a bite. Came back in, pulled into the ramp there, you know, Pirates Bay, and said, oh, Stu, you know, how is it? And he goes, no, how was it for you? And I went, bloody awful, never caught a fish. I said, I thought you caught them in horrendous condition. He goes, oh, no, no, we never go out. And then when it's that rough, no, no, we don't go out. You'd be mad to go out in that, but at least you've proved us, proved us incorrect. So I'd gone out as a testing. I was a guinea pig for that one. Anyway, but back to it. So we got the guys, we headed out. So Pete was there, Nigel was there. Now, Pete had caught small bluefin before. Nigel had never caught one. So this is going to be a good story. Straight out to the rock, and we're running out the rock, and I'm like, guys, you know what? Out here, it's only bluefin, eh? You'll never catch anything else. You catch albacore out on the shelf, and they've been catching some big swordfish out on the shelf there as well. In close, this is where you get bluefin. We hooked up straight away. Nigel's on, fighting his first ever bluefin. Seal's got it. And you know what it was? An albacore. Great big albacore. Can you believe it? Then we went, sprint rightio. We're going to get away from here. We're going to go in. Instead of heading offshore, you head back in towards the shore to go fishing. Then Pete caught one, and guess what? Another albacore. Can you believe it? We went all this way to catch bluefin, and we're catching albacore. But it shows, I suppose, how the times are changing, because you don't see big albacore in the shallows like that. You get little ones out wide, but not in there. So to make a long story short, we then headed down, and we're going down towards Tasman Island, and Stu had been catching or hooking. Sadly, he hadn't been landing the big bluefin. He'd been hooking them and pulling the hooks. We got down there. And when I say the weather goes nasty down here, one minute's lovely and calm, the next it's blowing 40 bloody knots. You tuck up under the cliffs and it's still screaming. But there's nothing south of you except for Antarctica, so it's bloody freezing as well. We get down there and we've gone across. He said, oh, we're sitting there and you go, this is the spot where I've been getting the big bluefin. You're right next to the rocks, the seals there. You've got the, the lighthouse. There's actually a lighthouse on the top of... Tasman Island, which is just south of where we were fishing. And how on earth people live down there, I don't know. Like the wind's blowing 40 knots down where we are, only against the cliffs. Imagine what it was blowing up there. Anyway, within a second, we're on. Nigel's hooked this fish and we all saw it eat the lure. 
And the weird thing is, it just swam up behind it like a marlin and scoffed it. He's hooked up on this thing. It screamed off. It, you know, did the thing. Fought it for about, oh, it'd be 15 minutes, I think. We are pretty excited about the whole thing. It was bloody unreal. This is it. And then the hook's pulled. There's that loss of a fish that only fishermen can explain. Like, it is truly heartbreaking. You just sit there going, you've done so much preparation. You've done everything for this one moment. And then it just, the hook's pulled. But that's fishing. And you know what? To his credit, Nige just turned around, put the gear back out and started fishing again. How good is this? This is what it's all about. And the best part is he got rewarded about, I reckon, 20 minutes later with, I think it was a 25, 30 kilo bluefin, which is a big one for down there. So it's really interesting. So down in Tassie, you catch either like 10 to 20 kilo fish or the 100 kilo fish which is the same as what you get in Portland over in Western Victoria and Port McDonald on the South Australian side there. They're only, like the schoolies are small or they're 100 kilos, which is really ironic because the fish we catch in New South Wales, because the bluefin season's underway right now, are generally 40 to 80 kilos or right up to 150 kilos. So you get those mid-ranges, but you don't see the small fish. So it's quite fascinating that Different fish are in different areas. Now, if we just look at the season right now, Victoria and South Australia have had a good bite. There's been some big ones there. The schoolies have been in reasonable numbers. Tassie gets a real mix. This year, the Tassie's been getting those mixed fish, those schoolies, those sort of 25 to 40 kilo fish, which are rare down there, as well as a few jumbos, as well as small ones. But at the same time, the fish are now starting to make their way up the New South Wales coast. So at the moment, they're still south of Eden, but they're on their way. They're starting to push up. And last year, the longliners caught a real mix of fish. They caught little fish in New South Wales. And while some people think this is bad, it's actually really good because it's a great thing that it shows that bluefin are different sizes, different age groups are, are all intermingling. So it's not one age group. You haven't one good spawning year, you had multiples. This is a good thing. And this leads me into the great story of the southern bluefin tuna. Now, the history is a massive part of this. And do you know what? There's a lot of speculation and everyone on social media have opinions about it, but I'm going to tell you the facts. This is what actually happened and this is how we've come to where we are. And what it is, it's a fascinating story because... We worked on it from earlier age, and obviously with fishermen, scientists, everyone being together, we changed it. And what we hear about the oceans in this day and age is how bad they are. Well, here's a good news story for you. But it all started back in the 50s. Now, Japan was targeting these tuna longlining because that's when freezer ships came in, and, and they were doing it basically up off Java. So the spawning fish there up in the north eastern corner of the Indian Ocean. At the same time, New South Wales and South Australia were pole and live bait fishing for them, which was imported from the US, so from down where they chase yellowfin. By the 60s, Japan was expanding its fleet and taking, I think the record number was 81,500 tonnes, and I think it was the early 60s. But by the 70s, Japan introduced a voluntary closure to protect spawning fish. So they actually, so they get a hard time, the Japs, but they actually went and stepped up to the plate and got off the spawning grounds. Because the thing is with fish in the spawning grounds is that they're the best ones to eat. So fish is hydrated up before they spawn because they need all the energy. So they've got high fat content, they're tastier. Once they've spawned, they're spent. They're worn out. Like you think of salmon, you know, they travel upstream. As soon as they spawn, they die. Luckily, the tuna don't die. They go and do it again. But the quality of the flesh and all that, they're all knocked around a bit. So obviously, the best time to hit them is before they spawn. In a conservation measure, it's the worst time to hit them. So, yeah. And while the Japs were targeting the spawning fish, we were hitting the juveniles. Because what happens is after they spawn up off Java, they run down the west coast of Australia down to Albany and then split. A lot of the two-year-olds go into the Great Australian Bight. Why they do it, I think there's because there's a lot of bilges in there, and then we hammer them. So we're, they were getting hit from both ends, you know, so it's pretty full on. And by the 70s, we'd gone from pers uh, into persaining. And of course, by now, 
by the late 70s, the scientists were warning that the fishery is fully exploited. And by 79, and this is really important, by 1979, the Australian fishing zone was declared. So the AFZ, which means 200 miles around Australia is locked up. You can't fish those borders unless you're a registered Australian fishing boat. Now, Japan had been fishing in these waters, so suddenly they're kicked out. So then they came back in and fished under our licenses. So see how it's all coming together here? And at the same time, by the early 80s, Australia had its record catch of 21,000 tonnes. Now, what's really interesting there is that was worth $13 million in the 80s. It was the most important fin fishery, both in terms of value and weight. So see, those old southern bluefin tuna have played a really important role, except, you know what we did with them? It was for canneries, because we had no idea about utilising the fish. So we'd catch them, and I think they get trucked off. To, I think they end up in Eden or somewhere, you know? But by the late, mid-80s, the global catch, the, bio, the scientists were saying, mate, we need to reduce it. So back in the 80s, we already knew there was a massive problem with southern bluefin tuna. Now, a lot of fisheries were being fished heavily, but we were actually looking at, the scientists were actually looking at acting on it. This is really interesting stuff. And for me, it's quite important because it's now showing where we're going at this very stage. Japan was fishing in Australian waters, I think under our license for this stage, and they started limiting catches. So I think it was a total of 21,000 by mid 80s. And with tuna models, which actually work really well, you can, it should have been okay. But of course, not everyone was fishing to it. And by 84, it was dropped down to Australia, dropped down to 14,000 tonnes. Now, this should have worked, and it should have worked globally, but the stock continued, continued to crash. Now, by 1984, Australia introduced a formal management plan. And this is back in the 80s, remember? They had a TAC of 14,500 tonnes. So it's amazing how things were coming in so early that we're actually making effort. And I think it goes back to, because back in the early 80s, bluefin was so important, you know, $13 million back in the 80s. Holy moly, that's some bucks. And by, I think it was the late 80s, there was major quota restrictions, you know, and it was around 15,000 tonnes for Australia, or total actually, 15,000 tonnes total. Australia was six, Japan was eight, New Zealand was just 450 tonnes. And at the same time, well, the early 90s was when they started trying to bring them into uh, the ranching system. So ranching is where you catch the fish in the wild, you bring them in, put them in a net somewhere close to shore, fatten them up, and then sell them. Why this works for quota fishery is the quota is based on the size when you catch them, not when you sell them. So if you catch them at, say, 10 kilos, fatten them up to 30 kilos, well, there's a fair profit margin there if you can get it, get it to work. And it was the guys from South Australia, the tuna fishermen there, who were all going bankrupt at this stage. So it's pretty good ingenuity on their behalf. And the Federal Research Development Corporation, who are the ones who fund a lot of these things, all working together. And this is this community working together to make this work. And I think they started, they were polling them. So they catch them pole fishing and bring them in. And look, it's taken a while. And now it's, well, it's a thriving fishery now. And 94, I think, was when the Commission for the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna was formally brought into play. Australia, New Zealand and Japan established it together because everyone's recognising there's an issue. And then the catch was formally, or the, the global catch, I should say, it was formally held at about 11,000 tonnes. Now, in theory, because tuna models work really well, this should have turned it around because we knew the fishery was in trouble and they're making an effort to change things. But what happened was it continued to drop and it dropped fast. And at the same time, Australia was ranching more and more fish because obviously that's the only way to do it. And Japan was at first was trying to, you know, undertake experimental fishing programs. So pulling a few Swifties there. Those late 90s, early 2000s was an issue. It was a tough time and the fishery is going down the gurgler. And of course, as recreationals, we never saw a fish. They were totally non-existent to us, which is such a 
you know, I remember fishing then and bluefin were gone. There was no chance of ever catching a bluefin. But as they can, as the population continued to drop, and I mean it was dropping by the late 2000s or the early 2000s, not late 2000s, early 2000s, they were down. It's something like the fishery was down at around 5%. Like, it's in dire straits. It's in serious trouble. So at the same time, Australia started to question the amount of fish going through the market because they weren't recorded. So bluefin were just going through the market. They weren't being checked. And it was the Australian contingent that started going over there and actually physically counting them. And they worked out that, you know what? There's too many fish. The figures just don't add up. And it's amazing to think that Australia stepped up to the plate and one person who plays a massive role, and he doesn't get any credit for this, is Glenn Hurry. So he got them to go and they started counting the fish. They worked out there was an overcatch going on. So they got an audit done and it was originally two Japanese, two Australians, and then it ended up being three Japanese and one Australian, uh, or, you know, scientists, researchers, whatever they are, and they counted the fish and proved there was a massive overcatch. And do you know what? Normally nothing happens. Everyone goes, oh, well, you know, we don't want to, do you, we, don't want, we don't want to wreck international trade. Let's face it. Glenn Hurry went in there to the meeting and said, this is going to stop. So he played a massive, massive role in changing things. And guess when that happened? I think it was 2006. And guess when that happened? That was in 2006. And guess when we started catching the fish? In 2007. So that really shows just what a massive amount of fish were being taken out of the system and we stopped. Now, on top of that, Australia paid for that research. So we always give the government a hard time. But you know what? They can have a pat on the back for that because they stood up, or individuals, like FRD, well, FIDC do the research, but AFMA and agriculture departments and particularly Glenn Hurry and the guys, stood up for fish and changed it. And we caught them down at Portland the following year. So that's pretty impressive. So I'll tell you what, he doesn't say much. He's a farmer these days, old Glenn Hurry. He played a massive role in saving the southern bluefin tuna. So this is the turning point, 2006, 2007. All of a sudden, there's more fish. But they continue to reduce the catch for the commercial fishery. So you've got to understand these blokes have invested everything into it and they keep getting told they can catch less and less. So imagine you had a pad you had a paddock that was, I don't know, 100 acres, and they said you can only use four acres of it. So you get a bit of ants between rec and commercial. These guys have been taking reductions after reductions after reductions the whole way through and still putting the investment in it and can't fish it. Because I think it was in 2009, they got a further TAC reduction, another 20%. So it just keeps going down and down for them. But do you know what? The ultimate thing is it's been really good because it's turned it round. Because I think in the stocks were still down in you know, 07, 09, I think it was down still really badly, down at 5%. And in 2010, they brought in or the, the Commission for Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna, CCSBT, introduced the Catch Documentation Scheme. Now, this was so you could record where fish were caught, so we could track them. The problem this brings is that we were wanted as recreationals, but guess what? We'd only just started catching fish again. So all the quota systems, we weren't even a part of because we hadn't caught fish in the 90s. As soon as we're not catching them, we go and chase other things. We're off in the East Coast chasing yellowfin, and all of a sudden, even though we've got a history through the Game Fishing Association way back in the 50s and 60s and 70s catching southern bluefin tuna, once the fishery was fished down so hard, we're off the table. We've gone. But the commercial sector was still obviously, because you know, they got a vested interest in it, they kept going. So when they suddenly bring in this thing that every tuna you know, caught or every southern bluefin tuna caught must be part of a quota, we forgot the recreationals. We weren't part of it, but we are still part of the fishery. So you can understand now where this gets really complicated, you know, and it's important that people, the recreationals especially, because I get lots of guys going to me, it's my right to catch them. Well, you know what? I never caught these fish as a kid. I went fishing for them, never saw them. 
So I appreciate every single bluefin I see these days because they weren't there. And so when some bloke goes, oh, it's my right, it's not our right, it's our privilege. And we need to respect these fish. So there's nothing wrong with taking a fish. But I'll tell you what, recently when there was some photos of those fish, those big 100 kilo bluefin that were floating down, I think it was the Barwon River down in um, Geelong down in Victoria, what a disgrace. If you don't eat the fish, don't kill it. And it, hopefully they catch those blokes and do something about it because for me, it's about making it better. So if I go and catch three bluefin, my kids go and catch 10. And if my kids catch 10, their kids are going to catch 20. It's our responsibility as fishermen, commercial, recreational, the whole community, to make it better. And if some self-centered little bastard goes and kills all these fish, well, there need to be ramifications for that because that is an absolute disgrace. Absolutely infuriates me that people think they can do that. Nothing wrong with bringing it home and eating it. And it's a learning process because for the commercial guys, even when they were doing it, their husbandry techniques have improved and improved over time, as have recreationals. Like when I first caught those tuna, those first big tuna I caught, I didn't bleed them. I just didn't know what to do. Now when we catch a tuna, it's gutted and gilled and bled because southern bluefin tuna are actually partially warm-blooded. So if you catch one, You've got to start cooling it down. So you've got to bleed it out. You've got to get ice on it. And it still takes hours to cool them down. So if you kill a fish, you need to prep it properly. If you went and killed a beast, like you went and killed a cow in the paddock, would you shoot it and just leave it there for five hours in the sun? No, you're in there processing immediately. And that's what you do with a bluefin. In fact, they were telling me recently, your bluefin, it's dictated within three minutes of catching it. Now, I'll tell you what, every recreational angler I know is guilty of leaving a fish longer than three minutes those first big ones I caught and I will put it up on Instagram down the track a photo just to show what it was and how it's changed and I don't want god if anyone sends some stupid comments seriously I just delete them now it's not an opinion it's trolling these people that just put up what we need to do is show and learn from what we did we kept three big tuna which I'd never ever do again and we ate them and they tasted average. Now when I catch a tuna, well, I might keep one now and again. I don't think bluefin are honestly that good to eat, to be straight honest with you. Um, it's processed properly. This is the thing. Fishermen are conservationists. We learn as we go and we constantly improve. So this is the problem we've got coming in now. So the tuna population, 06, 07, I think it was 09, they were still really, really low. But they started to turn around because I think I need to add in here. So with a yellowfin, when they spawn, they can do it within, I think, two years of age. A bluefin is 10 years. So a yellowfin can reach, God, I think they can reach it in like four years, they can reach 100 kilos. A bluefin is 10 plus years to reach that size. So they're a much slower growing fish. And this is why what we do now won't dictate next year. It'll dictate in a decade. It takes years and years. So that's where our responsibility as anglers right now isn't for today. It's for way down the track. And it's something we really need to be aware of because it's something that's important for all of us. And for me, I just get really passionate about it. I know some people will get angry and go, ask my right. Just, no. We need to look after these fish. We need to make it better. And the fishing's getting a lot better. I think now in 2017, they were classed at, I think it was 13%. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot. 13% compared to 4 or 5% in the space of six, seven years. These puppies are coming back and this is great. And for me, the big part about this that's so amazing is the recovery. The bluefin are coming back. All we hear about the oceans is the disaster and how we're overfishing it. There's plastic everywhere. All these hardcore greeny environmentalists are carrying on about it. They don't help, I might add. They just whinge about it. But here is a story where things are actually improving. And guess what? Some of them still whinge about it. Let's celebrate the bluefin are coming back. Because you know what? They've just been announced that they're now in a state of recovery. I think it's 20 years since we first started. I don't think we have many fisheries that we turn around like that and go, it's recovering, especially one of such high value. 
And it's a real credit to everyone involved. The recreationals, the commercials, the scientists, the fisheries managers, they always cop it hard. And even some of the greenie groups. We're all, this is it. We've all got to work together to make it better for everyone. Now, the bluefin numbers are coming back. In fact, you know what? One of my mates, Johan Yik down in Tasmania, has caught bluefin every month of the year. Do you know what? If someone told me that a decade ago, I'd have told them they're on drugs. This is the great thing. They're coming back. And this is where we all need to be involved because it's good now. And I think they're expecting that it's going to be 20% by 2030 or something. I think they predicted that earlier on. I actually think it's now better that it's it's coming back that strong. It is such an amazing thing how this fishery is coming back. And let's celebrate it. If you're catching bluefin every month of the year, like right now, they're coming up the east coast. And we get an amazing fishery here in New South Wales. It's not like Tassie, where in Tassie it's on the rocks, like you fish right in close. Up here you fish offshore and you find it's it's amazing style of fishing because you're trolling out in the open ocean. It's like blue marlin fishing because there's no birds on it. So you go down to Tasmania or Victoria or South Australia, there's gannets dropping in, there's seals everywhere. The place is alive. You do it up here, you're just driving along in the middle of nowhere and then all of a sudden one rod goes, eh, within a second every tiger is screaming, you've got them on everything and they're big fish. How good is this? This is what it's all about, you know? And the best part, up here we've been jumping in with them. And I'm going to go through that in a bit in a minute because a lot of people have been asking how you jump in with them. Some of the guys want to spear them, but I'll tell you a few tricks in a minute. So, and now these fish are pushing up the East Coast. So when it comes to catching fish in New South Wales, it's unlike anywhere else. So down in Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia, a, you fish right in close to the rocks, or inshore, I should say, not on the rocks always. Tassie, you do, but Victoria and South Australia fish with, you know, sometimes within a mile or two, and you're still catching 100 kilo fish. In New South Wales, it's all offshore. In fact, in all the time I fished in New South Wales, I've heard of big bluefin being inside the shelf probably once or twice. In fact, one was even caught at Montague Island, but that's a rarity. Hopefully, it won't be for long. Hopefully, we'll see more and more fish there. But at the moment, it's still a rarity. So where do you find them? You go out, generally speaking, past 500 fathoms, most likely on the 1,000 fathom line. Clean blue water around 18 degrees is prime. Now, just one point on that. When people talk about the water temperature, if you don't have a decent sound, like my Furuno is calibrated. So I know the temperature. A lot of cheap units aren't calibrated. So if it's 18 degrees... Your sounder says 21 degrees. If it's not calibrated, don't take it literally that it's 21 degrees. That's a really important little tip. They do like clean blue water, but I have also found them in some pretty green stuff, but it's still clean, clean and green. Now, it's trolling because you're covering a lot of ground. It's not like where there's birds on it. So down in Tassie or Victoria, mate, that bonnie are upwelling off Portland there. There's blue whales, there's gannets, there's seals, dolphins, the place is alive. Up here, you're driving around the middle of the ocean and it is absolutely bare. Like sometimes, we don't see a single bird. And for the life of me, I do not understand why we don't see birds on them. They're up here feeding. They're always hungry when we find them. So why aren't they, you know, on fish? I've seen them occasionally on flying fish or sauries. But seriously, if I go out and find a patch of gannets, I'll generally find yellowfin out wide. Not so much with the old bluefin. They just turn up at the blue. So you'd be trolling along, you got your spread out, and all of a sudden, bang, you're on, every rod goes off. It's the best feeling ever, because it's like blue marlin, you're sitting there going half asleep, and then, every tiger is screaming. It's like, yeah, baby, this is it. What spread? Let's get in the spread before I go any further. So we run Laser Pro. Halco Laser Pro has caught every one of my 100 kilo fish has been caught on the same color lure. Not the same one, just the same color, which is your blue mackerel. Put a VMC single on the belly, take off the trebles, and you're ready to go. 100, 150 pound fluoro leader, uh, suffix, anything like that, whatever it is, just fluoro is good. And you know what? I run one, a Laser Pro, way, way out the back. I alternated a bit now with a skirt, 
So I'm not sure. Sometimes I chop and change a bit. Small little eight, nine inch skirt. But a lot of the time, Laser Pro out the back because that's caught a lot of the big tuna. I do now run a Halco Max short on the lead, on the outrigger. Now, this is another thing that's interesting. A lot of guys don't run outriggers because they don't reckon they need them. The reason I run outriggers is simple. It's to get my lures in the clean water. It's not so I can put 37 rods out because I still only troll four at the most. It's to get them in the clean water. I've jumped in a lot underneath our spread. And when you look up, the prop wash and stuff like that is terrible. If you've got twins, you've got a pair of mercs on the back, it's twice as much prop wash. So for me, it's all about getting my lures in the clear water so the fish can see them. And plus, I actually like because your riggers bounce a bit, so it gives you that pulsing action to your lures. That is why I do it. And I remember when we first went to Tassie, a guy told me that you shouldn't use outriggers. And probably down there because you run against the rocks, you fish so close to them. But do you know what? I catch most of my fish from the outriggers still. So I'm using them, but it's everyone's choice. It's your own personal choice. And I'm waiting for the boys from hook them to give me one of those or order them in get those carbon fiber ones so they're nice and light come on mick hurry up mate i'm waiting for them so we run two lures two skirts that's general to do laser pro way out the back a skirt really long on an outrigger the other outrigger the halco max nice and short and then i run another skirt behind uh pretty much the, sh the short lure so just at the back of the wash there where it's a bit cleaner that's all I run. But what I do is carry a bucket full of chopped up cubes ready to go. And as we're trolling around, you're looking, you're searching the whole time, you're up on the site, anything. I know I said that you don't see much, but if you see a bird swing around, a little turn swing around, what if he's looking at tuna? What if you see a splash? Because this is another thing. Early morning, they, the tuna will sit on the surface. And you know what they're doing? They're sunning themselves. And you know why they're sunning themselves? To increase their metabolism. You get a sunny morning. So down south, you know, Tassie, wet, cold, howling, terrible weather. Up here, no, nah, they want the better The better the weather, the better it is. So it's the complete opposite. So a sunny morning. So I went out with that old Jim. Now, Jim's one of those blokes. He needs a few followers. So Jim goes fishing. Look him up on Instagram. He needs a few followers, the poor bloke. Because last time he did it, he went down. So he last podcast he actually went down so he's actually gone up a bit now i think he's cracked 300 so he's going off this bloke we were out there we saw the fish on the surf so we saw it looks like striped tuna they don't look like like it's deceptive how big they are we drove over to them and we're looking going i'm pretty sure they're bluefin and as we get up close you just see them rolling and that's awesome like seeing 70 kilo fish and you're talking at two square acres of them rolling on the surface and instead of trolling the lures through, we came up beside them. He cast out his stick bait into it, and you've never seen like it. If you want some fun, try stick baiting on them rather than trolling through them. Man, they went bananas. All the fish went smashing over it. And this is the best part. As we pulled up, a little of the lures sink. He's hooked up on the on the stick bait, so he's fighting that. Every rod goes off. He turns around and goes, Al, quick, grab a rod. No, nah, not winding one up. I'm going to let them all fall off. Is there something wrong with me? I don't want to wind them up. I just wanted to cube them up so I could jump in. So all the fish, you know, every rod's going off. Just like, oh, my God. I shook a few off before I wound them in. The last rod come up, the lure's hooked up on his fish. So I've left it. And then we're sitting there, and the rod starts barking. The telica starts, the Shimano telica starts going, eh, eh, eh. Now, the lure is hooked up with the fish that we've caught on the stick bait. So figure this out. We're looking at each other going, what the hell's going on? Trying to work it out for a minute or two going, I don't understand this. This is bizarre. And then all of a sudden we worked it out. You know what? We'd half hitched a fish. So I end up catching one without even having a hook in the water. Now that is a good fisherman. Let them all go because we had no ice. This goes back to another thing I was saying. We wouldn't have minded keeping a tuna. There is no point keeping a bluefin if you've got no ice. If you can't process it, let them go. So we let them all go. But how good is that? So stick baiting, this is just total tangent I'm going on at the moment, is a bloody awesome way to do it. So back to trolling. You've got a bucket full of cubes. As soon as they come up, as soon as you get a bite, and I've done it in the past where it doesn't matter if I catch a striped tuna, an albacore, because it's a bit of bycatch. As soon as I hook up, I start throwing cubes out. Bluefin love a free feed. And what you get is these fish come up, racing up to the back of the boat. And before you know it, 
there are hundreds of fish swarming around the back of the boat. And by the end, if you get them used to the boat, they call them blue dogs commercially for a reason because they just follow you around. So as soon as you get them on, just feed them, get them up. And if you're jumping in, and if you want to spear one, don't jump in and chase after them. As soon as I have them up at the boat, they're swarming around, I'm in the water and I sit by the boat. I don't race off. I'm only using a camera. I don't like shooting them, to be honest. They're pretty easy to shoot. It's not very hard. And I just sit in the water and drift out a little bit, then come back to the boat. So don't leave the boat. Stay with the boat. And normally it might take up to half an hour and then they just cruise around with you. The same with marl and a lot of other fish. It's patience. Don't be impatient. I know a lot of younger blokes are really impatient. It's like the old bull and the young bull walking down to the cows. Oh, wait, I shouldn't say that. Don't, just take your time. Do it casually and you'll get them. And plus the other thing is sometimes you get mixed schools. So you see the bigger ones like, you know, all the good ones, but then the really big ones turn up. So just don't go and shoot anything. Just wait, be patient and you'll see it. And I've had some amazing experiences, you know, jumping in. And you're talking hundreds of fish. There was one year there where George, who does Wahoo Charters, and Mick Latimer from The Complete Angler came out and we're chucking poppers out. We'd fed them up. And these are all 70 to 90, 100 kilo fish swimming around the back of the boat. And we're chucking hookless poppers because you don't want to catch them. You catch one or two. It's bloody hard work. I'm over that. All I want to do is have fun. And I'm in the water and these fish are smashing it around me. It was absolutely spectacular and you'd learn a lot from being in the water with the fish last year when i did it when we're shooting for the doco because we needed the underwater footage you know i jumped in crystal clear water shooting in slow-mo wait till you see these fish just cruising around the boat they are so graceful in the water but i will say a word of warning there are sharks with them so i'm not suggesting anyone jump in the water right so don't come back to me going well you suggested it and i got eaten don't jump in. If you don't want it, there's a risk jumping in the water when you're doing it 40 miles offshore. Play it safe and always, if you've got someone in the water, you must be watching. Someone on board must be watching. And of course, the boat has to be out of gear, guys. Come on. But we're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about bluefin because the southern bluefin tuna is on the improve and it's something that is so exciting and it's about to happen here off New South Wales right now. Normally, end of June, they kick into gear. So early June. So you've got a few months to start buying pilchards. Start setting your gear up because the bluefin are coming. And when they're here, 100, 150 kilo fish. I think the record's 170 kilos or something. We're going to beat that soon. Well, I'm not. I don't want to fight it. I've fought, a big, I've fought a big one. 155 is my biggest. And that's enough for me. I'll let someone, some of the young bucks get in there and have a go because this old bull's going to walk down slowly. Alrighty, as the last part of this podcast, we're doing things a bit different. We're going live. It's like live radio. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start, we're going to log on, we're going on Instagram, that's our McGlashan page, and we're going to start answering a few questions. And please make them about Bluefin. Radio, kick it into gear, trying to make it work. Nick, Nick Petrio, one saying hello. Yep, that's a good start. Adam0606, hello. Yes, right, come on, guys, we need questions. All right, Frank Gillian, how are you? Jamie Lack, KKK, are they recovering well? Now, that's a good way to start things off, Jamie. Do you know what? The southern bluefin tuna is blitzing. Now, it's blitzing because it almost was you know, annihilated, it went down to such low levels. But it's increasing. And the great thing is that everyone's part of this. We're all working together to make it better, but we've still got a long way to go. So they are recovering well and they can keep getting better and better. But we all need to respect them. We all need to be a part of it. We all need to be Tuna Champions, which is such a great program, and promote it in the right way. Absolutely brilliant. All right, we've got Coops McGlash and my young fella. I got none. Really? Of course you've got none. You're meant to be doing homework. Chris Gamble, reel in a couple. Yeah, we've done that. Nick Petrio, one. What is the lifespan of a bluefin? So a southern bluefin tuna can grow for around 20 years of age. That's not too bad. They mature at about 10 years of age. Um, and so they're fairly slow growing, considering that other species like yellowfin will latter you know, six to eight years, I think. So, yeah, not very long compared. 
Um, Hugh J, what they say, they say that SBT are critically endangered. What is the future for SBT for the commercial fishery? You know what? It's bloody good. The big thing is we kept fishing them. Well, we didn't. The commercial fishery kept fishing them. They just dropped the catch rate down to match the, the population at the time. And we used that money to help with research. And the, the most important, the critical part of this is that if we stop fishing them, we have no say. So it's an absolute priority that Australia kept fishing them. So we have a say and we are now part of the conservation measure. So they are looking good and they're growing. And it's because of the commercial fishing that we have the, the science or the research around them that we now understand them a lot better. So commercial fishing is not always bad as people think it is. Dave Tuck, you'll be up at Port Stephens for sure. Why can't we get the bluefin at Port Stephens? There you go. When they get them in Sydney and Broken Bay. Dave, because the water normally stops there. That's the problem. When the water stops, they don't go past. So with the water pushing up to north, once you get that, so which is normally Cyril Rocks where it stops, but now and again it breaks through and they do catch them much further north. All right. We've got Adam double or triple O six O. How many bluefin have been tagged this year? Well, it's hard to say. Now, in Victoria, they keep a lot more. In Tassie, they keep a lot more, and they don't tag as many because they've got seal issues and all those sort of things as well. But also, it will take roughly another six to eight months before we actually get all the tagging data in because, you know what? Some people tag them and don't hand their cards in. How absurd is that? Coop Simo, what's the best way to catch bluefin in Western Port Bay? Well... Coops, when they're in Western Port Bay, they're not in there a lot. When they are, you've got to get on them straight away. And they come and go. It's one of those things you just really need to be on them when they're there. Trolling's probably the best technique. And look for the birds. Watch the birds. Um, UJ, thank you. Nip and wetsuits. Bloody good wetsuits. Uh, Robbie006. When are they going to lift the bag limit in New South Wales? Robbie, why would they want to lift the bag limit? 40, 70, 80 kilo fish. Do we need more than one per person? I think we should hold it. In fact, we should have a boat limit. If you cannot process enough of a fish that size that you haven't got any spare stuff. We killed a fish the other day that was 70 kilos and it took forever. We kept feeding on it forever. So, yeah, they don't need to lift it in my view. See, I told you I'd be controversial with this. That'll set a few people off. All right. Camath the man. Uh, are the Vic tuna and the New South Wales different and the New South Wales tuna different? No, they're exactly the same, but they're different age groups. The Victorian ones, you get the two-year-olds, which are those 15 to 20 kilos, or two to three-year-olds, I suppose they are. Now, they swim around the corner, they're inshore, they get them in Tassie, and they get the jumbos, which are sort of those 100-kilo fish, which are around 10 years old. In New South Wales, we get 40 to 100 kilo fish, or well, bigger as well. So we get those mid-range fish, which I think they travel out along the shelf. So yeah, fascinating why the different fish or different age groups go into different places. Coop Simo, it's pronounced Coop Simo. There you go, I got it right. Fish sizzle, can I chase them off Sid? Can I chase them on fly off Sydney or Newcastle in a smaller boat? Yes, you can. Now, the key is you can do it, but it's when they come in. Now, not last, I think it was last year or the year before, they came right in against the shelf. So that's only 17 miles off Sydney. So it's it's about those currents. When the current pushes in close enough, they'll come in with the range. Other times they might be out further. If those eddies hold, they'll swim around them. They'll be miles out to sea. So it's really a matter of timing and a bit of luck there. All right, what do we got next? We've got... Seven Seas Apparel, biggest SBT caught in Australia. Now, I caught my 154, which is still the biggest on 24 kilo, I think. Never go through that again, I tell you that. That was the hardest thing I ever did. Uh, the record is 171, which was caught out of Marimbula, I believe, um, which was, well, several years ago now. And, of course, the 169, which was caught today, I believe it was, so which was out of Portland, I believe, which was on real-time fishing charters. Bloody awesome effort there, Matt. Bloody awesome effort catching one like that. Ah, rightio, next one, Adam, 0060. 
as any bluefin traveled to other states. Now, Adam, these things are traveling massively. Do you know what? Southern bluefin tuna spawn off Java. So northeastern corner of the Indian Ocean, they travel down the west coast. They come all the way around the bottom, up into the Tasman Sea. So through the bite, round Tassie, up into the Tasman Sea, and are now branching out to the other side of New Zealand in the Pacific. The other side, or the other way they go, is right across the Indian Ocean to South Africa, and they're now being caught on long liners out of Brazil. So do they travel to another state? They travel to another country. All right. Jeez, we're going through a few questions here. Uh, cruiser addiction what's your favorite way to eat them grilled on the barbecue for me sashimi is absolutely beautiful but you know what i'm not a massive fan of bluefin it's good because it's got a high fat content because that's why they're so uh, popular with the japanese because they live in the coldest water so they got the most fat but for me yeah i like lightly grilled on the barbecue uh, cruiser addiction what's your favorite way to eat them? that's what we've just done young Aussie angler do you think I'll be able to catch a bull shark in the harbor we're talking bluefin but yes but the season's finished January February March is the prime in Sydney harbor Indy Tomo how do you tell the difference between a southern bluefin tuna and a northern bluefin tuna apart from the liver prongs well you pretty much got it on there there's not a lot else we can do they're extremely hard to tell the difference, and I reckon there's probably been a few Pacifics caught, or Northerns, that people have had no idea. Generally, it's when they get larger. So a lot of them would probably go under for commercials, would go under quota. Although I don't think that's, there's that many caught because they're actually in a lot more trouble than the southern bluefin tuna. Last question for the evening. What size hook do you need to catch them? Rightio. If you're using a laser pro, swap to a single hook, use a... VMC inline single, and I'd run probably a 7 probably an 8 I think on those, just a single one in the belly. If you're live baiting, do live bait hooks or, you know, cubing and stuff like that, I'd be running a small tuna hook, sort of like a live bait hook in the 6 to 7 size. Uh, and if you're trolling lures, probably yeah, 7 8 style in trolling lures. And there you go. Well, you know what? We're going to have to call it there because, man, we've been answering heaps of questions. How good has this worked? This is it for another of Al McGlashan's podcast, The Best Job in the World. Bloody hard work, I might tell you. I will not be as long this time for my next podcast, but send me messages, tell me what you want, and we'll do more of it. And, of course, remember, Life on the Line, the Bluefin doco. It's taken me three years to make this, so I'm pretty proud of it. And it'll be out. We'll keep you up to date. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook. There's stuff coming up on the YouTube channel. Make sure you follow all those social media handles. Watch us in the Telegraph, online. Of course, Fishing With Mates Season Seven's coming out. Keep up to date and let us know. And of course, remember, let me know what you want because I will, and I guarantee this, I will get my next podcast out a hell of a lot quicker than the last break. I'll even give up fishing. As for now... I'm going fishing.